everyone. I'm here today with Rye Webb and we're here today to talk about the amazing WD200 um, just before Christmas. Uh, how are you? How are you feeling after such a long race? Feeling a lot better than I was, yeah, two two weeks ago. Yeah. I've had now a bit of a rest over Christmas. Amazing. So um, can we just start with a brief introduction into your running career and, and what got you into, you know, 200 milers? Yeah, so I've been running for about I don't know, 11, 12 years, I guess. Um, and it started with marathon, straight into ultras. All I did a road marathon, then basically never left the trails after that. So I work with Centurion as well. And then I've done a lot of their races over the years. And as soon as he dropped that 200, I was like, no, nah, that's just silly. That's too far, too far. <laughs> and then the worm was there and the bug just kept getting bigger. So it wasn't long before I'd signed up. And partly that's my girlfriend's fault being like, just sign up to it, do it. At which point I did rolled over and was like, you've now got to crew me for potentially four days. Yeah. Um, yeah, that came down to her actually me signing up for it. I'm terrible at talking about stuff and then going, oh, it's sold out. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, oh, what a big excuse. I don't know. It's signed up. <laughs> um, so so uh, what drew you to to enter them? What was that bug kind of feeling like? Um, had you, you know, you'd done 100 miles in the past. Do you think it was quite a big step up? Yeah, it was that. It was that step into the unknown, I guess. Like It's another string to your bow as it were to test yourself in a completely different way and it was I spent a lot of time trying to get my head around you know going oh yeah well I've done a hundred miler in this time so surely it will just be like this long to do 200 and then be like no I remember how I felt at the end of that last hundred miles and I couldn't go a step further yeah and you gotta do it again so yeah it's it's that whole process as well, the training, the building up to it, the planning it, the recce's on the course. And it's, it isn't just a 200 miler, it's months of planning mentally as well as physically, I guess. And thinking about it, it's sort of all consuming really. Once you sign up to it, you hit that button and you think you'll forget about it. And then you, it's every time you think about it, you're like, nerves just wash over me. Even like six months out, I was like, oh God, that's a long way. <laughs> yeah. um I've, I've driven 200 miles before and i'm like oh my gosh like it's actually really really far like in your head you're just like oh 200 miles and then you're like 200 miles that's a really long way um yeah. so i'm down in the southeast and when you lay it out flat it's like to the coast of wales or something it's like, <laughs> yeah it's huge it's like <laughs> So tell me a bit about your training because um, you can't obviously go out and run 100 miles as a training run. Um, what sort of training were you doing leading up to it? Uh, not dissimilar to a 100 mile training plan, really. Mm -hmm. I, so Robbie Britton's my coach and has been for, I don't know, nine years now or something, 10 years. So we chatted about it, had a plan going into it, trying to just add some more volume in a week for me. Um, overall volume and consistency really is what I was looking for mm. and not trying to get you know 140 mile weeks and then nothing for three weeks it's just that every week has got to be working so we were lucky we were out for my girlfriend was racing OCC so we were in Europe for that so we got to just at that point I was coming off the back of Leadville training as well so I'd had a big summer of training in America leading into that 100 miler being quite fit already so recovering quite well from that in a couple of weeks and getting back into the next training block quite quickly yeah which just consisted of quite a lot of marathon pace training to be honest so that I could get bigger runs with more miles and building that sort of endurance in the legs to suffer for a bit longer yeah and then race day you've got that to fall back on I guess but. yeah so did you recce the route then and do you think that really kind of played into your success there uh partly yeah I lived on the North Downs have lived on the North Downs for so that the start and end of the course I knew very well the South Downs I've run the 50 version of so there was a section of the South Downs that I haven't done I went out I recced a bit of that into the what would be a uh, third checkpoint and then all the way back up to Farnham mm. and I did the Vanguard Way section as well on a 
two different recce. So nothing, I didn't ever do a huge recce. I think our longest one was like 27 miles, 28 miles in yeah. one go. So I wasn't out for, or I was out for a longer day because we just made it enjoyable. We were looking for water taps. I was with one of my athletes, Kevin, who was actually doing it self-supported and solo. So he had a very different agenda to my agenda. <laughs> so we took it steadily. We were looking for shops. We were cruising along but yeah knowing the course definitely helped but I ran it and it was 24 degrees when I ran it and yeah. bone dry <laughs> yeah. a very different uh yeah different race when you then turn up on race day and it's completely sodden because we had a, a lovely big chunk of eight weeks of rain didn't we leading up to the race did that do you think that played into um nerves a little bit or were you quite prepared for wet conditions no I figured yeah I it was going to be wet um, <laughs> and I've been posting pictures for weeks before it of different sections here, there, the wet didn't really bother me. The thought of it at all, it definitely played into a part of it on the day that I realized I just wasn't going to be able to run at the level I thought I was going to be because it sapped quite a lot of early energy out of the legs. But I also, I knew that was going to happen like leading up to it. I was thinking about that and, sort of trying to make peace with that in my head that if it takes longer than I'd planned not to let that get in my head and just it's such early miles and once you get to the South Downs obviously always going to be better running mm. so allowing that to sort of almost wash over you a little bit and not get too much in your head but it's uh yeah it was wet <laughs> yeah so tell me about the the start line was there quite a bit of anticipation did you expect to win did you enter with the expectation that you know you were at least going to place uh I always like to like go into a race thinking I'm going to do as well as I can do but at no point did I think I was going to win I, at the time there was a few other athletes that were still Mark Derbyshire Tristan Stevens who were all in Sam um we're all in the pre-race preview as well and like I I honestly thought I'd be not at the front and I would be running from behind anyway I tend to finish stronger than I start in races anyway right and I don't start that fast relatively <laughs> in a 200 <laughs> um so yeah I my game plan was always that I wouldn't be in the front anyway I never expected to be out the front at the start and I was quite happy to be running with there was a group of about four of us at the start. Uh, another one of my athletes, I actually coached Tim, was running with us as well. So it's cool. We were just having quite a nice time chatting and enjoying it at that point. So it was, yeah, expected that I wouldn't be in the front. So I wasn't getting nervous about that and stuff. But yeah. I do get very nervous in the lead up to races anyway. Right. Um, not about the weather or anything like that. I just, that plays quite a big part for me. Right. Tell me a bit about your race then. Um, I'm sure you can break it down into more parts than I can, but did you have some highs and lows throughout those 200 miles? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm normally quite a happy, easy going runner. And for the first 30 hours, I was not happy and not having fun, <laughs> um, which is very unlike me. I quite I enjoy running. I like to be out there. And I just partly, I think what had happened, I got myself so nervous. I'd used up like a lot of nervous energy mm. and then come race. I just had like no well to dig into and there was no like enjoyment. I wasn't finding any pleasure. I was just going through the motions of running. And my girlfriend was crewing me in the van and even she was like, oh no, there's something wrong. And another guy down out on course who was crewing someone else said like, he thought I was going to drop at 50 miles because I was saying by 30 miles in, I was like, I'm not having fun. I don't really want to be out here. I'm not enjoying this at all. And that just went on and on and on. And I just could not get out of this like sulk that I was in. Yeah. Um and then went all the way through the night into the Thursday morning, into the Thursday afternoon. It wasn't <laughs> probably the Thursday evening, like I say, like 30 hours in or something. I actually started to feel better and mentally my physically I was fine I was moving all right maybe not as quick as I wanted to but I think that's because mentally I wasn't in it mm. um, and then I just started to be like oh yeah it's not too bad you know there's only 18 hours left now yeah. like so <laughs> it was uh yeah it started to turn around then and I actually started to enjoy it but then the back 
say third of the race, the last 50 K ish, I was feeling good. I had at one point, I even said, like, I've got loads left in my legs. Like they feel really strong. Yeah. Which was nice. And that was always my plan is that I knew once I got back to this end of the course that I knew better, well, I would be on my home stretch. I'd be on familiar territory where I knew, and that would just allow me to hopefully run a better finish, which in the end I did. And partly because I realized if I was stopping to walk at the close to the finish, mm. I was actually going, I was, my body was falling asleep and I was having these like jerks, you know, when you're drifting off to sleep in bed and you suddenly, I, that was happening while I was walking right. and it was me back awake. Yeah. And then I just couldn't walk. I had to run everything, run, jog. <laughs> yeah. So tell but me yeah, about that sleep cool. deprivation. Was that sleep deprivation? Did you? How much did you sleep within those two hundred? Because within a one hundred mile, you can just kind of power through the night, can't you? But two hundred miles, do you have to play a bit more safe? That was always my plan: was to go through with no sleep. Right. Um, anyway, I. So the Wednesday morning, no, Thursday morning. So I'd gone all the way through the night. The Thursday morning, I was walking up the hill to one of the crew points to see him. And I, again, I drifted off a little bit of a sleep, walked into a bush. <laughs> I was like, oh. so by the time I got to the van, I was like, this is stupid. I'm just not going anywhere fast. I'm going to have 10 minutes. Mm. So I slept for 10 minutes. That was about six o'clock in the morning. And then set off again after that and then I didn't sleep again for apart from tiny little micro sleeps while running <laughs> um, yeah and actually I felt really good and I'd staved off the caffeine for a long time all in the plan that when I did start using it I would then be on it for the yeah. remainder of the race so I was using caffeine gums coffee coke in large quantities so actually Thursday all day and night I felt really good yeah Wow. What was your nutrition like? Um, do you rely just on gels or when you're at a 200 mile, do you need to kind of prepare more with real food? Yes, I've always used gels in the past and drinks and stuff. And then my plan going into this was like, oh, I'll use more real food. I need to for a longer race. And I packed so much food in the van. My girlfriend <laughs> made a Victoria sponge the night before for wow. me. Wow. <laughs> I had one slice of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, it just did. It wasn't going in very well. I was. It was trickling in at the start. I had a few sandwiches, a bit of cake, donuts, things like that. Yeah. But I got a really sore throat and mouth, and I don't know why. I've never had it before, but swallowing anything was yeah. really hurting from maybe six hours in, eight hours in. Yeah. And. I was using precision hydration mm -hmm. uh, drink mix. I had a talk drink mix that I was using as well, coupled with that. And then the precision hydration gels, the 90 gram ones. Yeah. And I basically just ended up relying on those in the end. I think, I think I might've gone through 20. Wow. <laughs> and it was going in so well. I had no problems eating the gels at all. They were easier to squeeze in. I didn't have to swallow so much. So I was just drinking two bottles of energy drink and gels between each crew point and they were going down fine so it ended up being a lot more gel than I'd expected yeah but it was absolutely fine I, I still know what numbers I need to hit between each checkpoint you know, how long yeah. it was taking me so I'm still aiming at certain you know grams of carbs per hour basically and as long as I'm hitting that I know I'm fine I don't mind how it's coming so you must have overtaken Sam uh, at some point um how was that how did that kind of feel knowing that you were kind of edging towards into the lead in those last 40 30 miles yeah it's good it was it was coming for a oh, I said I won't say it's my overtake was coming for a while I was steadily moving behind him for quite a long time and I kept seeing his crew every time I got to my crew they were packing up getting ready to leave so I knew he wasn't ever that far ahead of me yeah the same vein, I never really asked where he was either. I didn't I didn't really mind where he was, especially a long time before that, you know. Yeah. Because there was just no need to worry about anything. And I didn't feel great. I didn't want to be in front either because I didn't want to be chased. I really yeah. didn't have the energy <laughs> mentally to deal with that. Um, so I ended up catching him around Alton 
which was with about 50k to go i think right uh, he actually it, there's a bit where you come to a roundabout and we ended up coming different ways around the roundabout and then meeting on the other side of the roundabout <laughs> walking into alton together there and then went to our separate crews and we left alton together as well and we ended up running that whole section together mm. before coming into farnham i realized on that section he was struggling a lot more than i was especially with the sleep uh, so when we came into farnham he was like, oh, i'm gonna have to have a sleep here with my crew and I was well prepared to be carrying on from there. So we separated there and that's where sort of the move, as it were, happened. And I then, yeah, ran to the finish on my own and he followed on behind. Yeah, he he had an excellent race. I spoke to him just before and, and you know, he was definitely inspired by, you know, the the tenacity that you showed in, you know, catching up and then and moving on and I think he has a lot of respect for you um so what do you think you learned about yourself as an athlete in this race as an athlete uh I don't know about as an athlete but just as a person <laughs> <laughs> no I don't know there's all I don't know it's there's more like there's a lot of mental strength that I've built up over years of racing and I guess going through different scenarios and but part of that comes down to my crew knowing me so well as well. Like my girlfriend crew and me knows that I never actually want to drop out. I just want to moan about it for hours and ruin her life. For <laughs> hours. It's um, yeah, there's, I like to finish strong. I guess that's what I've learned is that actually, yeah, I can always sort of rely on generally having that pick up at the end, but there's definitely things I learned in terms of the race. As soon as I finished, I was like, I should have slept sooner. I should have done this. I should have done that. And, you know, first time in 200 miles. So there's lots to be learned over that distance. What um, what sort of, what, thinking in. <laughs> what sort of things was uh, your girlfriend telling you when you were complaining at her? Was she like, just get on with it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's your bottles, there's your gels, go on. See you <laughs> in the next one. Yeah, <laughs> it's, we don't need a lot of words. It's just like, you can, you can do it. You're not, not dropping out. There's your bottles, carry on. It'll feel better, you know, down the line, you'll be all right. So it's very basic stuff that you need to hear at that point. But it's like, don't drop out, carry on and you'll be fine. Yeah, definitely. So, so do you think uh, a winter 200, you know, you kind of jumped in the deep end with a winter 200 miler. <laughs> do you the think, <laughs> do you think uh, it offers its own challenges that you may not find in, in other 200 milers? Yes, I mean this. It's quite a runnable course. Mm. Like, part of it for me is going into this. My biggest worry is my feet, and actually thinking about how I was gonna look after my feet in that much wet. Because I figured they'd be wet no matter what. Even if it wasn't like it was super wet, your feet just get wet on that time frame anyway. Even if it's raining or anything. So, and just thinking about the kit, what I was gonna use, and you know, what was going to be up on the South Downs? Was it going to be super windy? Was it going to be super cold and stuff? And we were really lucky. We had great conditions on the actual day. Mm. So thinking about, yeah, feet was the main thing for me, thinking about the winter running. Other than that, I'm quite a, a hot runner, I guess. Like I generally wear shorts and vest for most of the year. So I wasn't too worried about that side of it, like getting super cold. But it just... Yeah, there is a bit of a difference in summer running, nice dusty trails and stuff. And then it's just how much it does sap out of your legs, endless farmer's fields, which are wet. It takes a takes a bit out of you. So what's your recovery been like? Obviously, you had Christmas uh, to kind of help with that recovery. But, you know, in the in, in those short few days afterwards, how, how did you feel? Felt pretty good, to be honest. Um, finished... Friday morning and then we hung out for a while obviously the Centurion team were there and I know a lot of them so it was great to get back and see them uh had best English breakfast at the finish um <laughs> which I really struggled to eat because my mouth was so sore I was absolutely <laughs> gutted at that and then we we don't live far from the finish so we headed home we had like three hours sleep and then got up 
so it was like afternoon and one of my athletes tim was also racing and we saw that he was on the tracker coming back in towards the finish so then we drove back over to dorking to go and see him finish that night and we ended up hanging out there till about two in the morning yeah then going home like four hours sleep couldn't sleep so woke up again it was very stunted sleep recovery mm. um i could i found i could only stay asleep for about two hours at a time before i woke myself up with either like fidgety legs or just dripping with sweat right. i've never had sweats after a race and i was having to towel myself off wow <laughs> and it was just ridiculous but walking and stuff i was i was pretty good i probably better than I have been after shorter mountain races or faster hundred milers. I had two small blisters that we popped and they were fine. There was nothing wrong with them. Just slightly sore feet, just from the, like a little bit of trench foot, I guess where you get like the deep cracks in your feet, but nothing yeah. more than that. Um, and then, yeah, just getting back into a routine of eating real food and drinking when you want, not because you have to. Yeah. I think by the Tuesday I was back out running just like a gentle, we've got a little, little flat three, four mile loop around here and just getting back into a routine of getting the legs moving really. So you're feeling cool. all right now that we're in January, are you feeling a little bit more yourself? Yeah, still a little bit laboured in everything. It's just like I've got a bit of sludge in the brain, I think. Everything's still just a bit slow. <laughs> uh, I ended up getting a bit of a chest like cough infection going on. And I think that was just down to the pure fatigue, really, because otherwise I felt great. And then I just had this chesty cough for like two weeks over Christmas that I just couldn't shift. But yeah. it was a fair bit of drinking food involved at Christmas. So it wasn't <laughs> in recovery that well. <laughs> so what do you have? Now, in... Go on. I've been back out running this week and trying to get back into a proper routine now. Amazing. So, so what's, what do you have in store for 2024 then? Do you hope to maybe tackle the spine at some point? <laughs> that doesn't appeal to me as much, to be honest. Fair enough. Um, it's, this appealed to me because of the runnable factor and that there was more running involved in it. Yeah. I know, you know, all the lead guys are running a lot of the spine, but it's just a lot of kit. And yeah. at, the, at this time, like never say never, but at the moment it, it's not for me. Yeah. Uh, this year I've got a place on the 85k in the Lavaredo races and I've got my name in for a UTMB place which I should find out next week uh, other than that I've got nothing booked at the moment but I'm sure other things will take my fancy yeah Definitely. Well, absolutely. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, you, it was an amazing race. I really enjoyed just dot watching. Um, and yeah. I hope to, <laughs> I hope to speak to you in the future when we, you know, hopefully you get that UCMB place. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. For you. Thank you.